And we're out in Moira. It wasn't called Moira when I lived in it, it was called Mara. <laughs> it's got posh now, like, but it was Mara when we, we lived in it. I wasn't born in the Christian home, but we were sent to church in Sunday school. It was more to get out of our parents sent us to church in Sunday school to just so that they could have Sunday to themselves. And we would have bought the Sunday papers on the way home. And when I was 10, my dad had been sick. He had kidney disease. And in them days, there wasn't a say in medicine, medical help is what there is today. And when I was 10, my dad died. And I love my dad with all my heart. And you know, I have memories of him when I used to, we used to go walking up the Kil Old Doctors Road in Moore. It's called the Kilmore Road now. And I used to, when I was walking with him, and I used to, I knew he wouldn't, he wouldn't get any better. And I said to myself, I hope I can remember these days. And you know, I've never forgot them. And many a time I can just think back, and there's a wee girl walking beside him, and I can see him walking beside him, and I can hear him talking to me. And he used to say to him, you know, when he died, I owed him a fortune. And he used to say, Daddy, will you lend me sixpence? <laughs> and he used to say, what do you want it for? And, you know, he used to always give him it, even though it was only a packet of sweets or whatever. And I owed him an absolute fortune when he died. But I used to, to at night time, he would have got me up and he would have went to bed and he would have got me up to read the Bible to him. And... There's words I never can get my tongue around. I'm desperate, aren't the kids like my tea? <laughs> I'd, I'd say a word and it doesn't come out right. And I'd have said, Daddy, what's that word? He'd say, never mind, Monday, just read on. Yeah, and I remember reading the Bible to him. And when he died, like I knew he went to heaven. And it wasn't the years later that Billy Andrews could tell me that my dad trusted the Lord yeah, because Billy was, at the, was with him the night he'd done it. Yeah, and that's great comfort. Yeah, so... <coughs> I knew I was away to heaven and I missed him. And there's many times I think even yet I said himself, why I wish he'd, he'd have seen me as I grew up. I just, he missed so much, but I know we'll see him again. So I was at the CEF, they held meetings in our wee village in the summertime, and I went along to them. They held them for two weeks in, that time, at, in them summers. And they told us about Jesus. And it really was the first time I'd heard about Jesus and needing to be saved, even though it went to Sunday school and all. I never was told. Never heard it in the church. And I knew I needed to trust Jesus. And I did at one of them meetings I stayed behind. And I trusted in Jesus at 10 years of age. And I really meant it. Hallelujah. And I'd done a wee correspondence course with the CEF. And I'd done it for a couple of years. And I filled the forms in faithfully, sent them back with all the wee Bible things in it. And but then they sent me a letter they wanted to see me in Portadown. They come to a wee day out and with them. Well, I, that was the height of the troubles. And I didn't know how I was going to get to Portadown. And I was very quiet and shy, and I didn't like the idea of going to have to meet strange people. So that was it. I stopped writing. I never done the correspondence course ever again from that. And I never got in contact with them. That was me finished with it. But I read my Bible and still prayed. And then when I was 13, I met this man here. Oh, Boys <laughs> a boy. Oh, Ed, I got killed, I could tell you. If my mummy would have caught me with him at 13, <laughs> he wouldn't have been here the night testifying. And he probably wouldn't have been here either, but he probably have killed him. <laughs> so um, that'll be 35 years, the 12th of July, next next month, 35 years, we have been together but 27 years we're married next month and you know it's went in like a blink mm. it really has well Dar and me went together we were about phone about seven years and we got married and we bought a wee house in Queen Street when we were about 18 mm. and it was a wee rack of a place like but it lay for a couple of years and we got the money together to renovate it and we moved in after we got married and we were happy in Queen Street and we worked away and, and we bought a wee house then out in Donstown. We were expecting Christopher at the time. And I remember when we weren't saved at that time. None of the two of us were. And I'd been working down in Belfast and Dara was working on his business. And 
I remember when we were expecting our first child, and oh, we were so excited. And I remember when I went into labour and we were in the hospital, and there next the baby was born, and Dara says to me, "It's a boy," and I says, "You're a liar." I says, "I couldn't be, because I had my heart set that it would be a wee boy, because I have no brothers, and I don't know. I just always thought it'd be nice if I had any more children that there'd be an elder brother and." They'll say I'm not a three dark three brothers are as good as brothers to me as the blood ones would have been. And oh I was so excited. Oh, I love Christopher from the day I sat my eyes on him. He was special and oh he was great. <laughs> and I just enjoyed him and I couldn't go back to work and leave him. I just couldn't, I says the darling. We both agreed, we just said no. I stayed at home to mind him. It was it was hard and we had, didn't have the money. But what we got through, we really did. And two years later, I fell pregnant again and we had Nikita. Amen. And boy, I, the doctor says that's the one with the shits. <laughs> oh, was it? Oh, shits. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, I let her uh, yip out of my hand. And I said, oh, brilliant. And he says, um, what's that about? And I says, well, that'll be me finished. I have a boy and a girl and I'm happy. Oh, it was great. Oh, I was so delighted. I'd got what I wanted, a boy and a girl. My mum used to say to me, I hope you get what you want. Yeah. And you know, I got it. Amen. I got a boy and a girl and they were brilliant. Oh, I enjoyed the years that I've had with Christopher and Nikita. Yeah. Because um, they were good years. They were hard years because we didn't have an awful lot of money to spare. Like you see kids today and the wardrobe's full of clothes. Our kids would have had one set of clothes on them and maybe two more in the cupboard to put on them. But they said they were clean and they were happy. I was saying that they weren't always clean, they were always outside dirty, like, but sure they were happy. Well, um, we lived there for a number of years, not be house name. We got a wee site in Donstown, Darl, he always had his end. This wee site was called Lacey Dorns and it came up for sale. Nice star laces is up for sale. And mind you, we'd renovated this house where we're living in, and we'd lived in dust and dirt for months. <laughs> and Dar went up and we put a bit on the house, the land, and we got the land. And How long were you done? Dar rang Ford's estate agents, say about the land, he's putting an offer on. I was in one room praying that God would give him the land. Because I knew it was his desire, he wanted it. He was born in the village of Darlingstown. And he he really would he always used to say to me when we were walking down the roads, I'd love to build a house there. But we never thought we'd ever be able to afford it. But Dar got we got the land and we had to put the house up for sale. My sister says you're mad, she says you've lived in muck and dirt for months and she says you've the for sale sign up as soon as you get it right. And we didn't even know where we were going. With two kids and had sold our house. <laughs> but we moved up into Gilpin Park in a wee bungalow. Mm. Circumstances had arose that we were able to get this house. And it's why we were there that Dar's friend Joe Allen had asked him to go to a mission in Lurgan Baptist. And like, I wasn't keen on Dar to go to this mission in the Lurgan Baptist at all. Mm-hmm. And there was one Friday night he was meant to go, and I gave him quite a bit of grief about it. I wasn't happy. But he went anyhow. And then he told Joey to go back, and he was meant to go back on the Wednesday night, but there was some football match on, and he went away down to Belfast for that football match. And he didn't get But he went the following, he went the Friday after, because Joe was a lovely man, and Dar respected him. Mm-hmm. He was a good person. Yeah. And Dar went, well, that Friday night, Dar came home. And I opened the front door to tell him and he burst out crying. And he threw his arms around me and he says, Monday, I've got saved. Well, I was pleased for him, but at the same time, part of my, I wasn't. And I says to myself, that's all right for him. He's lived his life. He's lived in the pub. I've been with the family and I haven't. I didn't get out in the bite the same as he had. And I sort of way I said to myself, well, what's going to become of us? But I watched him. And this is a man who never lifted a book. And he started to read the Bible. And I watched him like a hawk over a lot of weeks. And he was changed. I'd got a new husband. 
and my children got a new daddy, and it was brilliant. And he, he was um, taking the shop, and the societies had changed. He weren't, he wasn't away out football, and he wasn't away to the pub, and it was just great. And then, um, I'd watched him, and then it came about the April time. It was one Sunday, and I was in the, my bedroom. And see, I'd, I'd went away from the Lord. When me and Dora started to go, more or less, when about six times. Mm. I used to read my Bible at night and pray. And when we got married, I read the Bible at night, but always when Dora was asleep, I never would have let him see me reading the Bible. I wouldn't have let him see me, because I thought he would have laughed at me, or you know, thought it was funny, and I'd have, read, I'd have said my prayers, but I never would have read the Bible if I was drinking. He definitely wouldn't have. And this Sunday I was in the living room and I got knocked with the star. I said, I need to get right with God. And I went down to my bedroom and I got on my knees and I asked the Lord to restore me and come back into my life. And I came out and I told Dara what I'd done. And he was so happy. So we went on and we got baptised in the church. And and we just tried to, our best to go on and I held the wee mission, Dar Ram missions in the Orange Hall in Darlingstown. I remember him going out with the wee bag over his shoulder to give invites out. And I says to myself, oh dear, how are they going to think of this? This is a man they can, he would have been a bit on the wild side, like a bit like, but there he went with the bag over his shoulder and he had to, and he gave out invites and tracks and all. But, it's in your mum and dad's saving. It's in your aunt Rhoda's saving. That's powerful. And your mum and dad's in the glory of the night. And that's brilliant that we'll see them again. Amen. But you know, life was just going along lovely. And we moved in in the another. We moved more times in the Don's town than anybody I know. We just like, you just say move house and I'll have it packed up and I'll go like. But <laughs> we moved again and I moved down to Cedar Lodge down the inn road. And with a lovely summer, there was a lovely summer there, it wasn't lovely and hot and my sister Anne up and Margaret and I played um, rounders and I would have been, that was one of the best summers. But at the end of that summer there was a storm going ahead of our family. It was a Friday night in September, Dar was getting ready to take a wee meeting down in Marlin. Prayer meeting, Marlin Memorial Hall, and he's going to preach. And we had brought his mummy home from the hospital that night, so it went down to the chip shop in Marlin just to get something quick for the tea. And I never would ask Dara what he's preaching. I don't ask him what his text is, that's nothing to do with me. When he brings the word of God, that's what God that's gives him. I don't interfere with it. But that night I asked him what he was preaching, and it was what a friend we had have in Jesus. But we were just about to find out what a friend Jesus was. I had went up the stairs and, like a blink of an eye, I took sick and started to vomit. And the kid around down says, Daddy, Mummy's not well. Well, I don't know what had happened at that time, but I said to Darl, I do believe I was a breath in death mm. at that time. Because I remember I sort of went away into the background. Now, it wasn't out of death, out of body experience, but I knew it was so dark around me. And I said, I remember saying, what's happening? And Dara says, there's nothing happening, you're okay, love. And I, when I came, so I ran, Dara was holding me, and the doctor was there. So they got me to the hospital in Craig Avon, and there was a medical ward, and up to the medical ward, and the wee doctor says, I don't know why they've put you up here. As far as they were concerned, I had food poisoning. So the consultant came on a Saturday morning, and he says to me, you see him yet standing on the bottom of the bed, just rocking back and forth. He never as much as put a hand near him, took pulse, no, no. He just says, if you can hold your dinner down, you can go home. So I says, right, I better get out of here. For there's no, I was lying away up at the top of the corridor, and there's no be near me. And I said, myself as well at home. So I well went home, and on this, and it was still, and it wasn't well on the Saturday night. But you know, I never could get off the cigarettes. I was still smoking at this stage. And I need to say this, that Friday morning, my sister-in-law, I used to love to go to my sister-in-law's house when I left the kids off to school. And I would have been sitting in her house smoking. And I said to her that Friday morning, before I took sick, I says, Dale, 
The Lord's going to have to put us in the blood of our back to get us off these figs. Well, I didn't realise my blood of the back was coming that night. And on the Sunday, the doctor came out, my own GP, and he gave me an injection for I was being sick. And on the Sunday night, I got up there, I was sleeping away, and I got up to go to the bathroom, and the room was spinning. And I was sick, and my head was thumping something fierce. Mm. And I said, the darling bed had gone, I'd shit myself. The pain was so bad. And the next morning, I got a doctor, and it was Dr. Southwell came out. And he says, there's something seriously wrong with your wife. And they got me back into the hospital. And this wee German doctor, she gave me an injection when I started to litch. Mm. Really bad, as if my skin was on fire. And she ran out and she got the antidote and she injected me. And then she had twigged them that there was something else seriously wrong. So I was sent down for scans. And later on that morning, Daryl came in and he started to cry. And he says, Monday. He says, they say there's a bleed in your brain. And I said, oh dear. He says, they're going to take you to the Royal. And when I was going in the ambulance, Doris started to cry. And I was crying. And I says, what about the youngsters? Christopher's only coming 10 and Nikita was coming 8. I says, I'm not going to see my children grow up. I worked with patients who had strokes in Belfast in the physio department. I knew what brain damage could do to you and what a stroke can do to you. So I got down into the ambulance and there was a policeman sitting on the bike to take me to the Royal. I got a police escort down the motorway. And I got into the Royal and up into the neurosurgery ward and Darl came down behind me. And I lay there from the Monday to the Friday, or the Thursday, and they decided that by Friday I was going to theatre. And on the Thursday night, I... I was just lying in bed and the anaesthetist came up and the only words he got out he says this is serious and I never heard another word all I could hear was be still and know that I am God and that's all I heard was be still and know that I am God and this anaesthetist was looking at me and I says he was looking strangely at me because he was, he was telling me how serious this surgery was and I was hearing, be still and know that I am God. I wasn't even hearing him. His mouth was moving and I wasn't hearing him. It's be still and know that I am God. And I says from that, there was a calmness came over me. And we talked all night. And we laughed and we talked about, but we never talked about dying. No. We talked all night. We never slept. And on the morning, on the Friday morning, they took me down to the theatre. And we said our goodbyes at the door. And probably was harder for Dara because he had to go back up and sit and wait. And I remember sitting inside. They waited about 10 minutes before they took me in to put me out. And like all sorts goes through your mind. But I didn't, never thought that I wasn't going to make it. I was just, I was trusting in God. He said, be still and know that I am God. So when he says that, he wasn't going to let me go. He held me in the palm of his hands that day. And... I remember it was six hours I was in theatre and I came out of theatre and my first thought was I went like that mm. and I moved my feet and I says I'm not paralysed yeah. and I, my sister says Molly she says that the nurses were really overjoyed when they see you doing that she says because they knew yeah. they didn't have to come and do my ops they knew it was okay and I remember saying to the doctor can you give me something for this headache and he says to me if I give you anything else he says I, you're not waking up so I didn't even need to go into intensive care. I was able to go back up into the ward. Yeah. And I remember them saying to Darl, it was on about was this on the Saturday, the doctors came round and they must have thought I was sort of a dozing and I heard the doctor saying to Darl, the next 48 hours is cr crucial, it's critical because I couldn't get my blood pressure s settled. And I said, so well, there you are, I've come through the surgery and now I'm still not out of the woods. But Everything settled down and I was okay. And all these eyes staples in the head and boy. I remember Darl he, he took me down to the bathroom and I seen a reflection of myself in the mirror and I burst out crying. I was looked like a monster and I says, Oh darling and he says, Don't you worry about a pet And I remember when I started do you remember I tried to feed myself? Oh, I knew where my mouth was but my coordination was off and I was feeding my ear and doing all sorts and Darl had to feed me. 
and he really looked after me and even when I came home he had to help me into the bath and watch me and he took a year off work to help me around the house because I was, I was tired and some days I was better than others but I had an awful tiredness and the wound wouldn't heal and Darren had the I remember sitting at the kitchen table and Dara was cleaning the wound and I had been sitting crying and Edda says, Dara, when is this ever going to heal? Because they were talking about putting metal plates in and I didn't want no more surgery. Mm -hmm. Because when they took the staples out of my head, that was the most painful experience I ever had because I am a fast healer mm -hmm. and the staples healed and he was holding my hand and he had to leave and I was screaming for him and he had to go and sit outside. And, I, and the wee nurse says, Mandy, will stop. And I says, you'll not because you'll come back tomorrow and it'll be ten times worse. Mm -hmm. So, with the cause them staples had healed so much and they tore the skin a bit, when they came out, there was an infection started. Mm -hmm. That infection went on for years. And they never got a metal plate in my head. The Lord mm -hmm. healed it complete, Amen. completely. Amen. Well, the following year, I fell pregnant. And there was problems from from day one and we didn't know what the problem really was so for a few months in and then my doctor says to me man he says you've been expecting twins he says but you've lost one of them early on and on the 5th of May 1996 I had a wee baby daughter called Rebecca and you know, Ed went into labour on that Friday. And I can honestly say the Lord was with me right from that Friday to the Sunday till Rebecca was born because I had a pile of Christian midwives who prayed with me. And they were brilliant. There was one called Margaret. And she, even on the Saturday night, she says, I went home. And she says, I couldn't sleep. And she says, I got up and she says, I rang in to see how you were. And on the Sunday morning she came in and the first of scripture she says the Lord gave her for me was, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And by quarter to two in that afternoon, Rebecca was born. And I prayed all weekend. I said, oh, praise God, let her live. The labour went on so long I thought she'd die. She was premature, too, too early. We were told on Friday night she wouldn't do once she was born. But I wanted her to live. I wanted the baby to be born alive. And Darrell held her in the palm of his hand. And we watched her for half an hour. And she died in her daddy's hand. But you know, she died in his hand. But she went straight to the prison of Jesus. And that's where she is today. And you know, she's never been tarnished by this world. And you know, we'll see her someday. We'll see her. There are planted a wee monkey puzzle tree in the garden in our memory. Because he says you probably would have been a wee monkey. <laughs> like the tree of a heart. <laughs> and you probably would have been. Because you know our Nikita. Mm. I'll tell you something. I used to wear four, four inch heels on our Nikita. Like, which is a wee girl. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I just didn't get in the floods. Because <laughs> when you see when she is about two, she cut a run like the wind and her hair would have flew out behind her and I yeah. would have had to run after that she. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you couldn't run after in four inch heels. <laughs> I'm still in flats with her now. <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, but then the fall, the, do you know what happened? With Rebecca when she was born, I was still smoking, even after being hammered and Dara couldn't believe it. He says, Mandy, what are you going to have to go through to get off these fakes? He was absolutely just disgusted that I had still smoke after all I came through. So on the Monday I came home and there was a lady in my, our house and she had a pack of cigarettes in her bag and I went and I took a cigarette out of it. And I went upstairs into the bathroom and I put the cigarette in my mouth and I took two pulls out of it. And I says, Frank, I says, what are you doing? So I says to God, I says, listen, Lord, if I can get through this without smoking, I'll get through anything. And I threw the cigarette down the toilet. And you know, I've never smoked yeah. from that day. Yeah. And people will tell you you can't stop smoking when you're under stress. Well, I don't know of anything more stressful when you have a baby uh -huh. laying in a wee white coffin, ready to be buried. And I haven't smoked a cigarette from then. And I don't want one. Oh, no. 
I sat when my sister was dying of cancer and she was in the Beaver Hospital. And she says to me one day, she says, I was just sitting with her in the ward and her own, she was on her own with me and her, and she says, Mandy, they love the smoke room more than me. And I says, oh, indeed they don't. And I says, but they just have to go for smoke. And you know what really facts me that she had said that. And you know, I wouldn't go back on the cigarettes and blot them off them. And when, it, when, it, when the devil came, it was the next month Dar had an accident in his van. And he ended up with broken ribs and in the hospital. And Dar's mummy rang me, she says, Mandy, now don't panic. She says, but Dar's in the hospital, he's had an accident. And I got over, Clifford came and took me to the hospital and I flew in. And the wee nurse says to me, come on, she says, and it'll be your face, she says, you're concerned. And the police woman says to me, she says, I didn't think he was going to make it. She says he couldn't breathe. And I says, oh Lord. He says, what next? I says, I can't take no more. I says, I've had enough. I says, you really can't. I says, brain hammock. By my wee, do wee girl. And I'm a husband's land in hospital. I said, I can't take no more. But then, um, the dog got well. The ribs healed. He got a new van. And God was with us, mm. even in that. And the devil would have said to me, I, he's out of the high school and get a pack of fakes. And I'd have said, no. Mm. I says, I'm not. And you know, when at the lip, I says to myself, and I always remember. When I got off the cigarettes, and I'm not tempted to go back onto them. And you know, her life went just on good from then, and dark going well in business, and we were happy, and as happy as anything, so we were, and we're two lovely children. The only thing with the kids that I regret, that they've grew up far too fast. They really did. I've enjoyed the years immensely with them. And I really love the time I'm with them now. They're growing up, and... You can talk to them and go places with them. And, and Christopher, when he comes home, I, only, I miss with Christopher and he's not about the house. When Christopher's at home, he would have come into the kitchen and he would have gave you a hug and a kiss in the cheek for no reason. And I miss that. And when he comes home, he still does it. And it's lovely. And Nikita, she's going to get married next year and I'll miss her in the house. And she's just, she's a good girl. I just, I love them both so dear. Chris was sent my card one time, he was in France, La Rochelle, for my birthday, and I cried when I got it. And I always remember, he says, it was it wrote in French, and it says, far from the eyes, but close to the heart. And I thought that was lovely. So time was went on, and then in 2005, Dar, he... We got the dog. We got a call. We both got the call really to go into the Lord's work. And in 2005, we were ready to go out on the mission in Marlin. And only God knows the reason why. But Dar took sick, and that was a very, very dark time in our life. It was very, very difficult. And you know, we had friends, and they turned out to be fair weather friends. We lost them. They didn't want nothing to do with us when Dar took sick. And that man lay in a settee in our living room for a full year. Um, he slept for 12 hours. He only woke to eat. He couldn't even talk to me. I had no conversation with him. Of course, the steroids had wiped him out. And when I told people that it was steroids made him ill, you know, they didn't believe me. They'd rather think anything. And I heard the rumours that were going about. And you know, they tore the heart out of me. And I they got to the stage where I had... In the house, I had the, a letter from a doctor that said that the steroids causes illness. And when people were ringing me up, I was saying, I have the doctor's letter to say the steroids made him ill. Mm. People said religion made him mad. No, religion didn't make him mad. No. If we hadn't had the Lord no, right. see us through, He's your he was our strength Amen. and our refuge. Amen. I'm glad we know the Lord. And you know, it's probably... 
It's not a bad thing to think that the Lord's made you mad. <laughs> drink what have made you mad. Right. So at least you're mad over something good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well heard. But you know, God has been good to us. Yes. He really has. He's brought us through a lot of trials. Yeah. As I said to you one day, we were in here and the music was playing. And I says to you, Darren, God has brought us through many a storm. Right. But we're not shipwrecked. Right. And you know why? Because we know the Master. He calms the storm. And I hope you know him too. And yeah. if you don't, I don't know how you go through life yes. not knowing the Saviour. Mm-hmm. don't know how you meet your trials and your troubles. Because mm-hmm. the Lord has been really good to us. Amen. And I thank William Leonard there, because one Sunday I was down in the pits. I was discouraged beyond belief. And William rang me and he says, have you got a daily bread? It was a daily bread book that you use. I don't use them, but... William says, you got this book, and I went, and he gave me the reading that day. And by it lifted me no end, and I remember saying the door. I said, people were being negative. And I says, he lifted me no end. So I just hope that you know my saviour tonight. And I hope that your troubles will be little. And that he'll bring you easy. That he'll not have to take you down a hard road to bring you. Because God is good, and I wouldn't swap him. And I wouldn't swap Dar for the world. Yeah. Would they tell you what he done to me the other way? Yeah. And finishing, I have to tell you, we were in Belfast. We went down to get Christopher a watch for graduating. I never left him in my life, but I left him that day. I left him standing. Yeah. We were in Castle Court. And there was this wee girl, and she works for the bank. And she says... Looking for the filling an application part, uh, form for a visa card. A uh, gold card. Oh, nothing like blue or anything, just gold. So Doris says, ah, that's okay, I'll, I'll play for that. And he says, you don't need it. And he says, I'll play for it. But she's asked him his name and all, and he gave it. She says, your bank? She says, Bank of Heaven. She says, spell that. He goes, H-E-A-V-E-N. I says, oh dear, here we go. She says, where's that? He says, eternity. And I, that's it. I said, I'm away. I walked off and I left him. They, they, they chewed the head of him and I got him. He came up and I says, what did you do that for? He says, well, did you never ask for my postcode? I was going to give you John 316. <laughs> so, honest to goodness now. He says, you'll not get it. So we were walking down Castle Court to give them an inf- RV track for the hands on it. And he nudges me, he says, look, they're looking at the track. And he says, oh, that makes it okay, like. <laughs> I says, you'll not get it. Well, you see, last, two weeks ago, the pin number came through the house. Yeah. He says to me, I'm getting this. And this week, the gold card came. So it just goes to show you. And I told our Chris for that when we were over visiting him there the other weekend. And the tears tripped them and the place be right for a meal and we had some laugh. I said, I've never left them, but I left them that day. <laughs> so, pray for me. <laughs> Thank you for listening.